Today, we are looking at a crime that took place at the very beginning of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to Sweden. Johan Philip Nordlund was born on March the 23rd, 1875, in the small village of Sattered in central Sweden. In 1882, when Johan was seven, his family moved to the larger town of Falun. Here he started school. However, he was a quite uneasy child and didn't focus on his studies. And in 1886, when he was 11 years old, he ran away from home. He traveled around with an older orphan classmate. But after a few months, they were recognized about 50 kilometers south of Falun in the town of Hedemora and the runaways returned home. After his adventure, Johan could not settle back in the family home. He felt trapped and wanted to make his own way in the world. So in 1887, he left home again and went to seek a better and more exciting life for himself. Johan was a tall child, so looked much older than his actual age, meaning he was able to find work. He managed to find a job in a sawmill and seeking more pay, he then went to work in a sulphur factory. But he only lasted in honest work for about 18 months as he was dismissed when he decided that forging some bills would be an easier way of making money. Now out of work and still a child, the young boy returned to thieving. He briefly returned to live with his parents, but there was no stability for him as his family had moved again, this time to the coastal town of Gable. To make some money, he began stealing horses and cattle, but he was caught and arrested and on September the 19th, 1891, the district court sentenced the 16 year old to four months in prison. Prison did nothing to rehabilitate him and after being released, he earned money by stealing sheep, which he then slaughtered and sold the meat. It did not take long for him to be arrested again, this time in the town of Halmstad. As this was his second offense, the authorities were harder on him and he was sent to prison in Malmo. He was released on the 30th of August 1895, but soon after he returned to his criminal ways and was again arrested for theft and arson. He was tried and found guilty, and this time was sent to prison in Stockholm. Prison has started to take its toll on Johan, and his attitude and behaviour started to get worse. On one occasion he started a fire in his own cell. The authorities decided that due to this and other incidents, they should increase his sentence by one year. The increase in sentence gave the prison director, named Karl Ludwig Palm, time to make a case to the authorities that Johan was a danger to society and should never be released from prison. The authorities disagreed and he was released on April the 20th, 1900. His brother had been working in Stockholm and encouraged Johan to get a job but with his criminal record, it was difficult at the start of the 20th century for a 24-year-old who had spent most of his adult life in prison to find work. So Johan returned to his parents' house in Gavle. <laughs> Johan had decided that he wanted a new life in a new country and wanted to be able to set himself up. He knew that his petty thieving would only bring him small amounts of money, but he wanted something bigger one crime that would mean enough money to fulfill his ambitions. The previous five years in prison had given him ample time to plan a crime that would give him everything he needed. On Wednesday the 16th of May 1900, he travelled to the town of Arborga, where he bought himself a gun, bullets, knives and padlocks. And when the shopkeeper was distracted, he even managed to steal another gun. He then purchased a ticket for the steamboat named Prince Karl, that departed the town at 7pm, travelling to Stockholm, across the beautiful Lake Malaren. He told the ticket seller that his name was Gronquist and said that he was from Stockholm. His plan was to rob the passengers aboard, steal the ship's register and set the steamer on fire, thus removing any evidence of the crime. It was less than a month after he had been released from prison and on that day he visited the ship several times when it was in harbour. He walked up and down the deck, he looked around and kept getting on and off the ship to perfect his plan. He noticed that some rooms, including the engine room, could be locked from the outside. 
He also looked closely at the lifeboats and the lifeboat release device. When the ship eventually departed, Johan spent the first part of a journey assessing exactly who was on the ship and where everyone was gathered. Unfortunately for him, there were not many passengers on board. Five men sat in a cigarette cabin on the top deck playing cards. On the middle deck, a mother sat with her two sons. There was also a man and a 13-year-old boy. In the restaurant, there were also a few staff and passengers. When he decided it was the right time, he locked the engine room with the padlock. At midnight, the ship's commander, Captain Ronholm, came down from the bridge. Johan attacked him. According to passengers who witnessed the attack, the captain was bleeding heavily. Johan next attacked the mother sitting in the middle deck, and this was followed by a man sitting nearby. The shouting, screams and gunfire soon got the attention of crew members who came to see what was going on. When Johan saw them, he fired more shots, but by now the alarm had been raised and the crew and passengers had started to hide. So Johan went to the bridge where he started randomly shooting. Luckily, another steamer named the Copping was passing and one of the waiters managed to send out a distress signal. Seeing that the Prince Carl had a problem, the Copping changed its course and made its way to the troubled ship. When the steamer approached, Johan started to shoot at it. The captain of the Copping, however, continued his course. Johan now started to realise that his plan to rob the crew and the passengers and then burn the boat was falling apart, so he lowered a lifeboat and frantically rowed to the beach. Now aware that the assassin had left the boat, the crew and passengers started to attend all the victims. They contacted the port and as they tried to save the injured, Johan rode away into the night. The Prince Karl continued its journey into Stockholm, arriving at 8am in the morning of May the 17th. There were police and detectives waiting at the quayside when the ship arrived. The crime scene was investigated and they examined the four victims. The captain had been stabbed in the back while the lady had been stabbed in the chest. The other two victims had been shot. Of the other nine wounded, they either had knife or gunshot wounds. All the injured passengers were taken to hospital, but one did not recover from their injuries, meaning the number of fatalities rose to five. The newspapers were full of the story and details of the crime swept across the country. Johan escaped with 845 Swedish krona. He made his way to the town of Eskilstuna where he purchased new clothes and shoes. Now immaculately dressed, he instructed the driver of a horse-drawn carriage to take him to the train station in the neighbouring town of Stogstorp. Despite it being a sunny day, Johan insisted the carriage hood be raised. He had seen the newspapers, which were all covered with headlines about the events on the Prince Karl. There was a description about a tall, slim man who had escaped the scene, but it seemed that everyone in Eskilstuna hadn't realised that this person could be among them, and everyone seemed to be getting on with their normal day. The police, however, were one step ahead of him. They had worked out that he would have to find his way to the other side of the lake and then try to disappear. They anticipated that he would probably make his way to the railway station at Skogstrop. The police in Stockholm contacted their counterparts to be ready to catch Johan if he arrived at the station. Three detectives were sent there and soon discovered a well-dressed man in the waiting room. The detectives tried to arrest him, but despite Johan trying his best to resist arrest, he was eventually overpowered and reportedly shouted, this was my revenge on humanity. He was then taken into custody. The day after his arrest, he dictated a letter to the prison priest that was to be addressed to his family. He told them what he had done and that he knew his fate would be execution. He told them not to grieve for him and that he never felt that he was part of society. He also wished his two brothers a happy and prosperous life. At his trial, Johan showed no remorse and never denied his crime. Many thought he would plead insanity, but he didn't, and the court soon found him guilty and sentenced Johan to death by beheading. While awaiting his execution, 
He twice tried to flee from his cell, but both times his futile attempts failed. Johann had the option of writing a letter to King Oscar II to plead for mercy, but he decided not to do this. While he was in prison, his mother visited him, and on December the 5th, he wrote his final letter to his family. On Monday, December the 10th, 1900, at 8.01 in the morning, with his hands and legs in irons, Johann was led to the scaffold in the prison yard. He said a prayer before the axe fell on the 25-year-old, and Johann Philip Nordlund became the second to last person to be executed by the state in Sweden. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening to another sad and tragic case. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.